this is Dr. Melissa Stiles with the Department of Family Medicine, and today's family cast is on hyperlipidemia. I'm very happy today to be joined by Dr. Patrick McBride, Professor of Medicine at the University of Wisconsin. Thank you for joining me, Dr. McBride. You're welcome, Dr. Stiles. <laughs> Let's start by talking about screening. Who should be screened for hyperlipidemia, and how often? Well, it's the key to cholesterol guidelines is finding the person most at risk. So. The recommendations are that all adults every five years are screened starting at age 20. We recommend screening earlier if people have multiple risk factors. So children with parents who have a family history of premature atherosclerosis, or if the parents have hyperlipidemias, known cholesterol disorders, or as we're finding frequently now, the children have multiple cardiovascular risk factors. For example, if you have a child with obesity, diabetes, or other cardiovascular risk factors, particularly adolescents with risk factors like smoking and obesity, those children ought to be screened prior to age 20 for a cholesterol panel. What are the major recommendations from the National Cholesterol Education Program, the NCEP ATP3 summary? The primary focus is finding the person at risk, as I mentioned earlier, and if a person keeps that in mind, that really helps in practice delineate who to go after. The highest risk people are people with vascular disease, and that could be in any part of the body, so people with heart disease, prior stroke, peripheral vascular disease, because if a person has peripheral vascular disease, they're at four to six times the risk of a peripheral or cardiac event. And then people with diabetes. So people with diabetes are at the same risk as a future heart event as somebody who's had a heart attack before. And then people with multiple risk factors. That's a very high risk group. If somebody has two or more risk factors and their 10-year risk is greater than 20%. And so we recommend risk factor screening and a 10-year estimate. There are many tools for assessing overall risk. What tools do you use and how does that affect the LDL? Well, with the ATP3 guidelines, we developed a new risk calculator. There's been previous risk calculators out, and we had Framingham redo their numbers for us so that we could take out the people that had diabetes and known vascular disease and focus on the people with risk factors other than diabetes. So a new calculator was developed, and it's very easy to find it. If you go to Google and just type in ATP3 risk calculator, it'll pop right up and you can do it right in the room with a patient, which is a very powerful education tool. Another place you can get it uh, is our website, which is heartdecision.org. That's heartdecision.org, and you can come up, and it's also got all of our handouts. By typing in the patient's risk factors, and the primary risk factors are age, gender, smoking, and their cholesterol levels, as well as blood pressure, you can find out what a person's 10-year risk is. And then what we do is we decide based on that 10-year risk what the goal LDL cholesterol level is. Different than other guidelines like blood pressure, a person's cholesterol goal is determined by their 10-year cardiac risk. And can you expand on the risk assessment based on if a person's at 20% risk, 10 to 20%, and then what the goals are for the LDL based on that? If a person's 10-year risk is 20% or one in five of having any cardiovascular event, including stroke, then the LDL goal should be at least less than 100. Current guidelines suggest that you should go less than 70 if they have vascular disease plus one other major risk factor. So we like to say CHD plus one. So if somebody has vascular disease and diabetes, vascular disease and continue to smoke, or vascular disease and blood pressure, then we recommend the LDL goal should be less than 70. There's at least five major clinical trials that demonstrated that. Otherwise, if it's just vascular disease, then the LDL goal is less than 100. If their 10-year risk is 10 to 20% by the risk calculator, the LDL goal is less than 130. And if their 10-year risk is less than 10%, then we recommend the LDL goal is less than 160. And I should say that the first line in our guideline was that none of these guidelines should supersede the judgment of the clinician in working with the patient. And Dr. McBride, can you also comment on the new recommendations in the ATP summary regarding HGL and triglyceride goals? We made a very strong statement in these new goals, setting new standards for HDL and triglycerides. Triglyceride goal should be less than 150, and HDL goal should be greater than 40 as secondary goals after reaching LDL goals. 
these were more restrictive than previous guidelines, and that was based on very significant evidence that triglycerides are an independent risk factor. We knew that HDL was an independent risk factor. Since the 2001 guideline was released, a lot more evidence has come in, even as recent as last week, that VLDL and HDL are as significant a risk factors as LDL. Another emphasis of the ATP3 is the metabolic syndrome. Could you give an overview of the diagnosis of the syndrome? Well, at the time we developed the guideline, evidence had accumulated that people with insulin resistance and central obesity had a powerful increased risk of vascular disease at any of the arteries in the body. And since that time, that has even increased in terms of evidence. And the prediction is that if a person develops central obesity, they'll very early on develop an increased triglycerides. That's the first marker they develop. And if they have triglycerides over 150 and increased uh, waistline, then frequently they'll develop hyperglycemia and then a low HDL and then usually later high blood pressure. That combination of high triglyceride, low HDL, high blood glucose, and it's a glucose greater than 100 now. In our guidelines, we said 110, but new evidence suggests that that standard should be 100 fasting. And then uh, high blood pressure. That combination is particularly lethal. It's a very significant increased risk for premature vascular disease.